right, everybody. Welcome to the X Foils. This is episode three. I am Dylan, your host. I forgot to do that in the first couple of episodes, so <laughs> I thought I'd properly introduce myself again. And I've got Walt the fifteenth here with me. <laughs> yes, yes. Good to be here finally. And dude, congrats on making this whole thing come to fruition. It's pretty awesome to see this come together. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. it uh, it hasn't been a lot of work, so. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was just, it's hard to, you know, the day to day and the, get the life and, you know, to find the time to start, like, actually do it. Um, but I'm really liking the outcome of it. Uh, episode three in the books now, which is going to be nice. It's awesome, man. Yeah. And uh, coming out with a bang. I mean, obviously, look at this setup. Pretty, yeah, it's cool. Pretty, pretty sweet. You know, sitting on some inflatables. We got the mics. I got tunes. I would say the inflatables are probably the the, the, the lowest <laughs> tier of. I, I love that you mentioned that first because like you're like I got a fifteen hundred dollar mixing board and all these mics, but I got these like fifty dollar inflatable I, couches. I got it on sale. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> love it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we've been talking about this for a while now. Um, me and you, especially. I don't know who came up with the name the X Foils, but oh, it was definitely me. But we can we can move past. Well, that. I'm gonna roll with it because you're <laughs> definitely too busy to do this. So I'm glad I, I could take the role. And no, I'm just kidding. You'll you'll be on the show definitely more than once. This is not a one off. Um, we've got s too much to talk about. That's for sure. For um, sure. For sure. Your water sports journey is super interesting, and uh, I'm a big part of that. Yeah. Yeah. You're a big part of my journey, which is really interesting because you were kind of onto the foiling and getting a little bit crazy about it and you pushed me a little bit more into it so I don't think if you were around I would be as I mean for sure the time would come but I think you kind of you know pushed that role a little bit and that that momentum into this foiling world and trying to find the best kit and, and like every kit that you had I had in the shop it was kind of like you yeah, know, we were a, a team. It was a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, I got it in the shop, you got it, and we all, we'd ride it. And then they're like, look at this stuff. I'm like, okay, I'll get it. We got it in the shop, and you had it, and we had it. It's like, you know, it was like a, that's how it rolled in. Um, I thought you were starting that question off where you were just going to say, you know, I, I've, I've turned you into a beer snob, and that's really, that was really oh, yeah, the and also I our, handed you. Our <laughs> first our first sponsor of the uh, the podcast. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Un, the unofficial, because Walt just brought beer. Um, Wicked Weed Brewing. Yeah, um, I gotta go talk to the boss, but yeah, I think I think it sounds good. I mean, I can just a couple cans. I'll pay for a couple. Oh beers, no, we are know. totally the unofficial sponsor of the X Foils podcast, Wicked Weed Brewing. Nice. So that's your your first. Uh, that's my day job. <laughs> your day job, just making beer. Mm -hmm. I my I mean my part time job is drinking beer. So I would say it's you know, bordering on full-time these days, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, not, let's not get into that. <laughs> We've got no problems here. Just foil addictions, all right? Yeah, just addicted to water time. Exactly. Yeah, so introduce yourself a little bit. Well, we're in, again, I, I'm horrible at this, but we're in Puerto Rico. <laughs> we are in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Which is a big part of this podcast because, I mean, Puerto Rico is an epic spot to be. You mm -hmm. know, there's tons of waves, there's wind, there's endless spots. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great um, place to be if you're foiling, kiting, winging, and all of that stuff. So oh, pretty much year-round. And you came here on vacation, you know, and met us and, you know, eventually moved here and kind of fueled that water sports addiction. I mean, it's nice to not be putting on a wetsuit and stuff like that, right? Oh, so. yeah, for sure. I mean, look, <laughs> this island is so special. And it's, it's you know, when you started this podcast, it's like, how how much do we want to talk about how special this island is, right? Yeah, but it no, is, it sure. is, it is. It's it's Hawaii of the East. You know, you're three to four hours from any major city on the East Coast. We get insane swells, like 10 to 30 foot all winter. Great winds, 300 days a year. Um, just a really great place to be able to push yourself uh, and, you know, never put a wetsuit on, which is insane. Yeah. And a great community, right? Like yeah, a course. bunch of frothers and... Um, it's still a small community here, which is really nice. Like, I, I think we we kind of foiling, you basically know everybody who foils at a, at, a, at your level on the yeah. island, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, downwind community, very small. Very you know? small. <laughs> like, like one hand, like two hands small. Yeah, we were talking about it that I'll have to have, like, one by one. You know, Gio was on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, episode two, if you didn't listen to that. That's Gio, and uh, he's part of the downwind crew, uh, yeah, unfortunately. Shout out, shout out to Gio. <laughs> <laughs> Took a foil to the butt today. <laughs> He's like currently sitting in the hospital <laughs> with a cut on his lower 
buttocks, <laughs> yeah. which is that's a bad spot. What to a great be. word to say, also <laughs> buttocks. I know. I, I had reminds to throw me that of that uh, that uh, Monty Python skit. You know, I guess I'm showing my age, right? <laughs> yeah, I like Monty Python. Yeah, I got some of that. Well, that's because you're Canadian, but yeah. anyways. Well, um, so yeah, let's introduce yourself just a little bit. Well, just brief. You know, a yeah. little bit of history because we've got a lot of stuff to cover here on in the water sports world. Yeah, so. I assume I assume we'll we'll dig into history at some point. But um, yeah, my name is Walt Dickinson. I I'm gonna kind of do this as quick as I can. I was born in Montana, grew up in Southern California. That was where like I found the water. Um, I was growing up in LA. Um, I was lucky enough to have family in Carpinteria. Um, Santa Barbara area, so I'd be up there every summer and, you know, uh, boogie boarding, just getting smashed by shore break. I don't know if they, like, unknowingly allowed me to just push myself into things that that maybe were, like, a little bold for a, a 10-year-old or 12-year-old, but they kind of, like, let me do my thing and, and never held me back from anything. So surfing and, and whatever was part of my life. I got super into scuba diving at that time. Um, you could, you know, it was, like, 12 years old, I think, was the, the youngest you could be. So I remember when I was, like, stoked on that and, and got into diving with my dad and, and snorkeling and spearfishing and uh, just being in the water as much as I could. Um, and then, you know, going back to school and playing basketball and doing all those things. But uh, moved away as a 15 year old to Western North Carolina. I was very confused. Uh, I went from, you know, the urban life and ocean and basketball and, and whatever was happening in California to like the, the sticks of Western North Carolina with all these trees and people with funny accents. And um, so that was a wild journey. Um, anyways, grew up there. Uh, so much to talk about in growing I up, whatever. But Walt, I said, keep it short. I man. am. Come this on. is my speed version. <laughs> like, dude, I can go way deeper. All anyways, right, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, and then, then basically got into uh, play basketball, went to college there got into rock climbing after I dropped out of college because that's what you do and and then traveled traveled the world climbing for like five six years um and then came back decided I had to start making some actual money instead of just trying to guide because as we know there's not a lot of money in guiding whether it's kite instructing yeah. or rock instructing whatever yeah um great lifestyle but doesn't really get it done so I, I came back and um started my first company which was a uh gutter cleaning and roof maintenance company and and that worked great seasonally so i could climb uh at a certain but that was point. also fueled because you were a climber right you were just like climbing up roofs yeah. and like tying ropes and stuff no was that kind of why or no yeah yeah totally all right so <laughs> all right this will be the first long drawn out story that probably happened so i'm <laughs> i'm first up money <laughs> yeah so i'm in my early 20s uh i've been like doing this kind of rock uh, rock guiding, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking people out or I'm doing uh, site work and stuff for camps at seasonally and then going on the road climbing. Um, I'm in Yosemite, which is a, you know, kind of the, the mecca of, of climbing. And I'm up climbing a kind of obscure route on El Cap and I fall like 20 feet, hit a ledge, break my leg, uh, actually shatter my heel, um, self-rescue, like that was a whole adventure of, you know, getting off the wall and crawling out and all that stuff. But then I came back and I'm like, well, shit, I can't make any money so I can go climbing again. Uh, and my buddy who I went to college with was like, he, he was doing landscaping and whatever. And he hit me up and he's like, hey, I, this guy's got this tall house and he, he wants me to clean the roof or clean the gutters. You think you can come over and rig some ropes? So I'm like dreadlocks in a boot, you know, whatever, <laughs> show up over there and like get all my gear out. We rig it up and like, an hour later, we can made, I find we a made photo of you in dreadlocks? Rarely, rarely, <laughs> but yeah, I think there's a few floating around. You know, this is like when you still had to take photos on a camera. I mean, I'm not that old. I'm, I'm, I'm 42, <laughs> but but it's so bad. <laughs> I know. I'm but, not. I'm not that young. I mean, I know. <laughs> you're hilarious. Anyways, go on. So 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 I will find you that photo. Maybe that could be the cover photo for this yeah. thing. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, we make like a hundred bucks or 150 bucks. We split it in like an hour and a half. And I'm like, well, this is way better than whatever the fuck else I was going to do. So I go home and then, you know, higher ground gutter cleaning, make up a flyer and grab my mom's leaf blower and ladder. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that started, started my first company. I mean, I kind of come from an entrepreneurial family. So it was like, it felt comfortable to do it. And uh, yeah, that was my, my first journey that led into like, well, if I'm going to run a business, I should do something I'm excited about. And 
Uh, at that point, I'd been home brewing since college, kind of off and on, like guerrilla home brewing. You know, as I went around the, the country, I would like go, so I'd go to Joshua Tree and I'd meet somebody and like teach them how to brew beer and build them a setup so then I could like still make beer. Even though I was living in Joshua Tree climbing all winter, I'd go to their house like once a month and make a beer. And so I kept it going. Um, and anyway, so I get to the kind of the, my, my mid twenties, late twenties and my sister who also has gotten super into brewing decides, Hey, I should open a brewery. And so we had the conversation together and we're like, well, if we're going to do it, let's do it together. Let's do it in the South. And, uh, found some other partners, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point, the, the Guthies and, um, put together, uh, a pitch book for, for what the, what a, what a brewery would look like and, and yeah, made it happen some way magically. And, Wicked weed happened. So that's been my journey the last 10 years of making just, beer. and Just a bunch of magic, huh? Yeah, yeah. It just happens, dude. <laughs> it's all about timing, you know? Yeah. Timing's about psych. Good and, timing, mm -hmm. good people, mm -hmm. you know, a good vision. Yeah. Well, success is this combination of, like, skill and timing, right? It's it's like you have to be exceptional at what you do and have the right idea, but it's timing plays such a huge role. And, and I think being able to open my brewery at this kind of – you know, crescendoing moment of growth in craft beer and excitement about craft beer it really put us in this position to really say something, right? Like, I, I think that we were, I, it's, I think it's, this has been kind of my, my journey in life is finding, finding the edges of things, right? I think that's why I fell so in love with foiling is that, you know, even in beer, I got super obsessed with Belgian style beers and mixed culture fermentation and all this like weird esoteric stuff. I mean, that said, we sell a shitload of IPA and that's mostly what we do and I love IPA, but it's- I, I love IPA. Yeah, yeah, I mean, who doesn't, right? Uh, but it's those edges, right? It's that it's that kind of cutting edge frontier style, the, the place that's just like the nerdiest and the nichiest. And I mean, you cannot argue that foiling is not that, right? And when you talk about our journey and foiling together, um, you know, my obsessiveness with like that, right? Like finding the edges, finding the new equipment, struggling to make boards, the, you know, with very little instruction, <laughs> yeah. you know, stuff like that. I think that's part of the journey of like finding, finding those edges. And, and then once you find that, you really understand what you're doing. Yeah. Whoever's listening to this on the East Coast, they've got to know who Wicked Weed is. At least in the Southeast. Yeah. So, yeah. so, I mean, I'll give it like a speed rundown. Uh, you know, Wicked Weed, we started the brewery in 2012, like December 28, 2012. Um, and it was based in Asheville. We were really focused on making a lot of West Coast style IPAs. We were a brew pub at first and just, you know, had an amazing journey uh, for four and a half years of, of growth, mostly in, in North Carolina. Um, won a bunch of medals at some of the big competitions and stuff. Uh, and then uh, we started getting approached to buy some bigger companies to acquire us. And one of those big companies was uh, Anheuser-Busch, um, so Budweiser. And, you know, at the time, it, it seemed pretty crazy to, to take the leap, but we did in 2017. Uh, and now my business partner, Ryan Guthy, who's the, the GM and president of the company, uh, he and I have been running the company for the last seven years under uh, under Anheuser Busch family. Yeah, mm -hmm. getting more distribution, growing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Growing a lot, growing yeah. a lot. Yeah. Ton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're we're just expanding this year to like the whole East Coast, but yeah. you know, hyper focused on quality and and making uh, I know. super dope <laughs> IPAs, right? I know it. I've 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 come to visit in Asheville a couple times and. You'll walk into a grocery store and you'll be <laughs> at the fridge pushing your boxes to the front. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm restocking. Like, Keep that shit cold. You know, you're looking at the dates and you're like, no, nope, this is uh, this is about to go. I'm taking it off the shelf, you know, and, and then you buy it and and take it away so that the customers get the best of the best. So it's it's pretty, pretty interesting on that that level, you know, where <laughs> you where you started it and where you've gone and then you know, how, how in touch you stay with, with everything. And, you know, I've got beer, we got beer here, we got beer in the fridge, you're, you're taste testing, you know, right. it's, you're right. still, I mean, you're still at the heart of it, which is really cool. And it's, I mean, I've, I don't know half of what you do, but I've, you know, seen you in meetings and it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, they, you know, I get to still run the creative side of the company. That's kind of always been yeah. my backbone yeah, yeah. Is, is the creative side. So the branding and obviously the what's what's the beer we're going to make next and what does it look like and working with uh, these amazing brewers that we have and yeah. um uh yeah it's just I, I feel very lucky to have such a special team to work with and yeah we get to keep doing dope shit yeah. so it's fun um so me and you met because you came to puerto rico one day on vacation yeah right it was like two weeks or something like that i don't can't remember how long you were going to come for and 
uh, Holly booked a, which is your your girl. Yes, my amazing, <laughs> supportive, incredible partner. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she booked the hotel, Numero Uno, mm -hmm. right, where we had the kite school and what we were setting up. It was very much in the beginning, and she booked it because there was pictures of kites. Yeah, yeah, we saw the kites on the beach in the <laughs> photo. The I was like, well, this will be good for day one. Um, yeah, showed up at your place, and literally, like, two months later, we moved here. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you planned a, what? Oh, one, a 10-day trip, and we stayed three trip, weeks? Stayed yeah. for, like, three <laughs> weeks, yeah. yeah. I remember you guys, because... At that, at the beginning, me and Shadi were still. Uh, of course, you remembered us. <laughs> I mean, course. come on. I just, I remember it very vividly. Of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We spent a lot of time together, but it was very much in the beginning, and we knew everyone that was staying at the hotel and who was coming to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I saw you two days in a row, and then you had a kite board, and you had you'd been kiting on the beach, and we approached you and one he saw evening. Me, he was like, "This is a sucker. I can yeah. sell this guy a lot of gear." <laughs> Anybody. <laughs> no, but I saw you at your kiteboard, and we, like, sparked up a conversation, like, oh, how's your stay, and what's up? It was, like, a romantic evening, you know? You guys were on the beach. It was after sunset. It was, and, and we hit it off, and the next day we hung out, and, you know, just after that, it was just And then you were like, nonstop. why do you suck so bad at kiteboarding? You should buy more gear and get better at this sport. I was like, oh, I don't know about that star kite, you know? You might need something else. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Hey man, you gotta you gotta go through some gear to get to the no, good stuff. No, for sure, hundred yeah, yeah. percent. Yeah, everybody does. Um, I love that star kite. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that was it was really cool to you know from the beginning that you came in, we hung out a bunch. You went to the West Coast, and you stayed for I guess because your kite level wasn't that like oh yeah great. I was not there. Um, the spots over there are not mm. super beginner friendly. Mm -hmm. So you went over there for a couple days and then you came back to San Juan, right? The plan was to stay over there for the rest of your stay. Which is funny because now I live exactly where I, know, I went. That's where I was going. Because <laughs> now, now you're like, I can't be in San Juan. And you're like over exactly where you went when you were here on vacation. I don't know. What is that? Five years, six years ago, five years ago? Yeah, yeah, five years ago. Five years ago, yeah. Yeah, no, I just live at Shaq's Beach and <laughs> yeah. get to be in front of, you know, Mike Leeson and see Nick and those boys out there ripping all the time, which is obviously super inspiring. I think I think if you want to be into stuff, you got to be in the spot, right? Like being around talented athletes and people who are progressing and pushing. Same thing with beer, you know? I, I, I mean, I, I incorporated myself into that niche community of folks who were like hyper-focused on pushing limits, you know, pushing things forward and... I think that's what foiling gives me. And then this island, I think it gives it to me in abundance, right? Like, I think you have Lyft. I mean, one of the iconic brands, I mean, the backbone in a lot of ways of, of, of a lot of foiling. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they've been doing this stuff forever, right? Yeah. Since the beginning. Um, and to have that in our backyard, and I think the culture that builds is really special. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very cool, very cool brand mm -hmm. and good people behind it. And But dude, it was a journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what was the when was the first time that you foiled? It was on a kite. Oh yeah, yeah. So so I mean, I came to foiling from kiting, right? And um, uh, which is which is a great way to get there. I think I think there's always like, how do you get into foiling, right? Foiling's if, if sorry, I'm adjusting my mic like 50 times. Yeah, here yeah. You're just anything. very uncomfortable there. Well, you should be sitting on an impact. Well, because I'm sitting. Just do it again. On a inflatable chair. I mean, so I next step, I we're going to get real furniture. I don't know. It's nice. I did give you those nice used couches over there. I don't know why we're not using those, but. Eh, they're not <laughs> great. One of them's broken. <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I, got into, I got into foiling via kiting. Um, and again, you know, I just, I am innately drawn to the rough edges, to, to those places that are kind of pushing the boundaries. Like, I want to be doing the thing that nobody else is doing with, okay, so climbing. My climbing career. Like, I went from. You know, a lot of people get into climbing, like, I'm going to go bouldering, and then maybe I'm going to go sport climbing in a gym. Like, I never went to a gym. I went bouldering outside. I was like, this climbing's awesome. And then I took a trip to New Zealand and taught myself how to trad climb with a buddy, which is where you're, like, putting your own gear in and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you put it in wrong, it comes out. So, you know, it's a little bit more advanced. And then from there, I saw my first magazine with, like, a picture of El Cap. And as quick as I could, within, like, two, three years, you know, I was in Yosemite, like, plugged into the scene climbing El Capitan, eventually got into speed climbing, which was uh, a really amazing journey where we're, we're climbing these big, you know, these are two, 3,000 foot faces that usually take, you know, anywhere from two to 10, 15 days to climb, depending on the route. And 
Um, I got into this style. It was really, really peaking at that moment in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, which was speed climbing, and I was doing those walls fast, right? Trying to trying to do them in a certain time, um, which made them very adventurous and and very risky, but super fun. And so I was quickly drawn to all those pieces because, again, those are those are the edges of climbing. That's where like shit's progressing, and and I found that super interesting. So I think when I came back into water sports. You know, I was looking for some of those same things. And when I saw foiling, obviously, like, it's not really necessarily about risk level. It's more about, like, what is it bringing to you? Like, are you pushing the way you think about things? Do you feel, there's a feeling, right, of doing something that very few people understand that you think is so magical. And I think, yeah. I think foiling kind of gave me that when I saw people, Dylan specifically, like, flying over the water. Um, you know, that was, a, that was a moment where I was like, wow, this foiling thing looks super cool. So... I think, yeah, as, as always, you sold me most of my gear. You got me set up well, with all a, of it. I don't think you have a, ever have had a piece of gear that's not from me. I'm sure I have something. I buy no. a lot of gear. No. Maybe like. I think those jeans you're wearing are from me. They probably are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But yeah, you bought a slingshot. Yeah. Like I aluminum it. setup, like whatever. Yeah, you whatever. Know, the space, I don't know what space that is. Space skate. Skate, skate something. Skate or yeah. something like that, yeah. And you had it, I don't know. It you, was a great foil. For it like was, yeah, five it was minutes. fine. You learned how to use it. Mm -hmm. You learned on it. It was great. Yeah, it was um, great. Well, I, well, I, I got it right before COVID. Everybody talks about COVID because foiling and COVID kind of came together in this magical union. Yeah. And anyways, I got, I got. well, lockdown happened here. I bailed. I went back to, I actually went to South Carolina. My sister had a, a beach house there and, and whatever on Folly Beach. And uh, great crew, great foiling crew there. Uh, Chris Sizemore, who's still one of my good homies, uh, he was already foiling. And so... I went out and like struggled a few times with sessions with him. And then I remember coming down here for like uh, two weeks or whatever to come see you guys again. This was when we were like wanting to yeah, be down here more. Yeah, yeah transitioning. And uh, got out um, in Ocean Park and I went out two, three sessions a day, every day. Yep. It was right after a huge tropical storm. And I remember like, I guess, uh, some of the sewage plants or whatever had overflowed. So I remember, I think I saw like five or six turds that week. And, and I'd just be sitting there. That, sounds, to like, that kind of sounds like where those guys, uh, Liam and Freddie, kite <laughs> <I> know, <laughs> the right? generic foil pot. I know. And like, I mean, Puerto Rico, the most crystal clear, pristine, beautiful water. And I'm out there diving my kite and just watching a turd like float by me, you know? Because I mean, if anybody's. If any of you have learned to kite foil, those first few days or first few whatever, you are drinking a lot of water. I yeah. mean, you're getting just face plants and just getting drugged through the water. So anyways, that yeah. was really where like I was able to fly in a meaningful way. Like I was able to do it a little bit in Charleston, but there like I, I got it figured out, right? I was jibing. I was, I was able to do all the things. Yep. I was able to finally foil. And uh, yeah, I mean, I never looked back. Like I put basically the surfboard away. My twin tip. Well, the twin, the twin tip you put, you put far, far away. Far, far. The away. surfboard you kind of kept. I you know, keep the surfboard. You're right. In between. Because you know, yeah, because there's some good sick, swell dude. and yeah. um, where you live on the west coast, it's really ideal for it as well when it gets big. Mm -hmm. And but now you don't do it at all, although you should. But then you're just you know you gave away all your stuff. <laughs> get, yeah. Well, when the kites get three years old because you haven't touched them, it's time to let them go. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah so, but, so but you still kept it a little bit close, which yeah, is yeah. which is kind of cool. Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, look, it's, <laughs> it, all these sports are epic, but it's like, how much time do you have? How good can you be at so many things? And I've really decided, like, all my energy is going into foiling. Like, I think that, and and every year, like the discipline's expanding, right? Like this last year with downwinding, yeah, yeah. like the journey that that's epic. been. So so yeah, so kite foiled a bunch and. Um, watched you guys get into winging and then, you know, made the journey into winging as that sport was developing, which was well, really you were, epic. You were there that when my first wing arrived. It was a slingshot oh, I remember, wing yeah. with the inflated trailing edge on the back. I bought, a, I bought one, like a 4.2, and I was trying to learn how to wing on that, that space skate slingshot <laughs> foil with a 30-liter board, the, my kite foil board. And I'd go out there and I'm like, well, it's foiling. I could go out and... 13 knots. I'm a great right? foiler. I can I just, just do like this. Yeah. For hours walking up the beach. I have a photo of me like walking up the beach with this weird carbon board, the 4-2 wing and like 13 knots. Like, I'm going to get this one day. <laughs> it was it was impossible. Bro, I definitely don't forget because I look fondly back on how much you sucked at that moment. 
you know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it gives me peace inside because <laughs> you progress so quickly with all these things. So it's important for me to remember that you are human and, and you suck at things too. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, I, yeah, I can, yeah, I can definitely suck. Yeah, yeah. Long journey with winging, but man, winging! Wow, what a sport! You know, like it really just opened my eyes. All of a sudden, I was detached from the kite lines. I was able to like just flow, you yeah. know, and and it pulled in all of the backcountry snowboarding and all the, the other board sports I'd done like into one place. And and it's kind of funny. Like I often like to people who don't foil, like snowboarding is kind of like a powder day is, yeah. is very similar to that feeling of foiling, right? Like big carves and just that, that feeling of just cutting with no resistance. If you don't know how to foil and you don't foil, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, mm -hmm. you know, what it's all about and how it feels. And, you know, people come into the shop all the time. So you're trying to like explain it to them. Like, what is this sensation of this, you know, foil? Yeah. Right? The electric foil isn't a for us, it's a great way to get people into the sport because people come in, they, they want to learn how to do something mm -hmm. like kiting or winging or whatever. And the foil, is, the electric foil, you know, the e-foil from Lyft is amazing because we take them out. And I would say typically everyone gets up and starts riding and foiling in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine like if, if that was available? I mean, I guess it was available back then, <laughs> you know. I assume the e-foil was available when you started the wing. Like we, I hadn't, yeah, yeah. I hadn't been doing it. Oh, right? I totally should have done that. But I mean, I had the kite, right? I had that kite background. I think it's no, definitely the best way yeah. to learn to foil. If you don't kite. If you don't kite, have a background. Yeah. If mm -hmm. you don't kite for sure. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. kiting. Either behind a boat, yeah, e, -foil, e foil, or if you're a kiter, like, yeah. I think it's good to hop on. I mean, you should just learn how to kite foil. Cause then you build this great base, right? Like I was able to kite foil a ton. We have the outer reef here in ocean park. So I was taking the kite foil and going out and surfing. Yeah. And I think it put me in a really good position that once I figured out the wing and how to pop up and get on foil, all of a sudden I was in a really comfortable place where I like I felt comfortable on the foil. I could, I could jive. I mean, I was able to jive immediately, right? Yeah. Like turning and, and riding the foil was easy. It was just like, how do I power myself up? You know? So yeah, the wing journey was great, and then that led into proning and you know all the other shit. Towing, obviously, the tow journey has been insane and yeah. epic and hilarious. <laughs> I think back to those early days when you. Dylan, I mean, just, you know, thanks again for just dragging my ass out there with, like, I should not have been being hucked into the waves you were throwing me into in those days. On, like, the Lift 120, when the Lift 120 came out. I mean, what a revolutionary foil that, like, just changed the way I thought about everything. I had no fucking idea how to ride that that foil. And we were out there towing on it, and I'm just, like, getting nuked, like, flying around, getting yeah. just pounded in the sets, not knowing what I'm doing. But, you know, that's you know how, how to, you get here. You like know how you, to swim? You, well, you got to be willing. I mean, <laughs> it goes back to if you're not falling, you're not progressing. Yeah, if you're yeah. not pushing yourself to the edge of, of where you're capable, yeah. then you're not really moving forward. At I kind of always have had this like life rule of like fail fast. You know, like you want to push yourself to failure. You want to do it with risk assessment. And I think that's one of the great things that I think climbing brought to my life was learning to assess risk in a meaningful way. So you're able because. I think innately as humans, we fear things much more than the reality, right? Like we, could be, we can build up these fears about this thing that sits in front of us and, and what the consequences look like or how it's going to impact you and, and really limit yourself. When the reality is like that fear, it, it's really like two steps further than, than where you think it is, right? And, and where safe is, is, is somewhere in between. So, you know, finding that quickly and, and understanding that and failing and learning from those mistakes, it's been... Our mantra at Wicked Weed, my mantra in life is like, fail fast and learn from that mistake and don't fucking fail again, right? Because like repeated failure, that's where, that's where you're, you're, you're making real mistakes. But how you progress is like pushing yourself to those limits, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy how, how quickly... So thanks for you, that. Yeah. <laughs> throwing you into that. <laughs> but I, I mean, I wouldn't take anybody anywhere that I felt uncomfortable, you know, of course, and that you couldn't handle. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I... I mean... Yeah, I think it was, it, again, it was a nice thing with my climbing background, like, and comfortability in the water. Like, I don't know, waves, I I think I've built more respect for bigger waves as my journey's gone on than I maybe had at the beginning, yeah. you know? Like, I think it took me getting wrecked by some, like, 12, 15 footers and go, like, okay, I can imagine how much more powerful these bigger sets are going to yeah. get, and now I have a really healthy respect for that. But, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Putting yourself into some <laughs> sketchy situations. Yeah, <dude. laughs> Yeah, we've been into some pretty nasty, 
nasty places for sure. Yeah, it had some magical. I mean, you know, oh, again, yeah, the, yeah. the swells here are just incredible. I mean, to just get these consi- this winter specifically. I mean, we've had every week we've had like somewhere between an eight to twelve foot swell come through all every, winter, basically. Yeah. You know, it just builds and dies. Fires and comes dies. Down, yeah. We get a little window where I mean, dude, I've only winged like <coughs> maybe five, six times all winter because we've just had such good surf. There's just been, a, been there's been a ton of. I think there's just been a ton of cold fronts up in the States Mm -hmm. and it's been pushing down and it's been pushing Northwesterly swells toward us, North swells. And then it's been kind of killing our wind, you know, it It hasn't, it hasn't been the best, uh, winter for us wind wise for the six years that I've been here. This has been probably the the most inconsistent season that we've seen. We've, we've had a lot of waves, but you know, it's it's been a little bit more sporadic. I don't know how the surfers feel about it because I'm not I'm not so honed in on the surf. I know I I go into it and I you know I prone mm-hmm. and then I tow and like when the swells come around, but I'm really kind of focused on what the wind's doing because it fuels my my whole business. Yeah, because essentially because you're not you're not eating if it's not <laughs> yeah. the wind's not blowing. Yeah, if the wind's not blowing, then yeah, we're not you know paying for diapers and yeah 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 yeah. No. yeah. Um, so it's it's I don't know how how it's been comparably swell wise because also as the years have gone on, the first couple of years I had no idea about swell. I'm not a surfer, right? I learned mm-hmm. how to surf on a foil, and that was well into my you know my foil journey here. You need a beer? You're just oh, like, yeah, you're yeah, yeah, a little yeah, bit you're antsy. Right. Like, like, you know, my beer is empty. I want a beer. <laughs> Somebody have me a beer. Yeah, no, I'm I'm exactly I'm exactly there. You know, it's like yes, Perny Hayes, thank you. Oh, that's what I needed. So, you know, these, these beers are shipped in from the brewery. We do not distribute Wicked Weed beer here in Puerto Rico, uh, unfortunately. And it mostly That's has to do with uh, cold shipment. You know, all, all, of, all of our beer is... There we go. Katsa. Katsa. All of our beer is um, cold stored all the way to retail. It's like one of our differenti- differentiating points uh, that also maintains, like, the freshness and makes sure the IPAs taste yep. the way we want. Um, and it's just hard to do that down here because I, I looked into it because obviously I'd love to have our beer down here, but yeah, I'd love to. I have don't get to drink it as here. much as I like when I'm when I'm visiting, so it's good to good yeah, to be. it's good to have a couple mm-hmm. a couple wicked weed beers here. Shout out to Joe, Jason, and Drew for uh, shipping this down so we could drink it tonight. <laughs> yeah, nice. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Sometimes Walt uh, gets a beer shipment here and it ends up in my shop. Shh. <laughs> 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 But I mean, I, I take my fair share. Yeah, you know, yeah. As, a, you, you ta- as the receiver, you tax it pretty yeah. hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like there's a daily tax depending on how long I'm oh gone. Boy. More beers get drank. You gotta right? be careful because I'm not I'm not really a beer snob. I'll drink whatever, but I do appreciate a really good beer. Yesterday, actually, thanks to you, you know, I was in the shop the other day and I was like, oh wow, they've got you know, they've got my one of my favorite beer that they distribute here, the Rainbow. And I looked oh yeah, up I'm on a gang. Beautiful brewery. So I looked up on the shelf, and I'm like, oh, it's warm. I'm like, oh, this is not how it should be. And I mm-hmm. grabbed it. I grabbed the cans. I look at the bottom. It's like, it says t- 2023. I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Another you one know? bites the dust. Yeah, you know? I was like, nope, back on the shelf. It had, like, rust on the bottom of the rim. I just don't think that was a popular grocery store for craft brew, um, for craft beer so yeah, yeah, yeah. i was like yeah this has been definitely been sitting here but for now a while. you know now you and know now, now i know yeah i i do now look at the bottom of the cans and see if it's fresh or not and this is the gem this is the gem that people should take away from this episode is that like it's true if you want to drink ipa look at that date on the can yeah you know, look at the matters. bottom and see best buy mm-hmm. you know if it's you know if it's a little bit past it's still fine if it's if it's been cold the whole time then it's still fine it's not burnt out if it's sitting on a shelf warm yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Best Buy, <laughs> it should have been in a fridge. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, to, I mean, to go back to what you were saying, it's like, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe you're right. As our skills have progressed, right? Like we're towing more. We're 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 surfing, right? Like our proning and and sup foiling and and towing has really progressed over the last couple of years. So yeah, yeah I, I'm way more tuned into what's happening as far swell as swell. Wise, yeah. Now then, you know, we got we all got oh, jet skis sure. and you know. So now that I'm paying attention more, is it is it a better year or am I just paying attention more? But definitely being on the West Coast, you know, I'm 30 minutes from Rincon. I've got all the amazing surf breaks around Isabella yeah. and, and Wilderness right there at the point. So, I mean, the surf culture there is incredibly strong. So you kind of you kind of can't help but be tuned into it because, man, when the swell comes, I mean, the community is frothing, yeah. you know, and it, it's really cool to see that energy and 
what what incredible athletes we have on this island. You know, the surfers down there are just such badasses. I, it's one of my favorite things when it's, you know, macking mac 20 to 30 foot at Wildo to just go down there and sit in the mist and, and watch those guys dropping in and doing stuff that is far beyond anything <coughs> pretty I'm intense. capable of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's pretty rad. For sure. Um, but you surfed a little bit when you were growing up or not much. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, as much as a kid could. You know, I, I remember, you know, getting used boards at garage sales and, uh, I, again, it's, it, that was my first, you know, I think I bought a just totally chewed up uh, uh, little mid-length and, and um, my parents let me do a bunch of fiberglass repair <laughs> as like a 10-year-old, you know, working with like all these toxic chemicals nice. and shit. No mask. No mask, no yeah. nothing. Yeah, exactly. I love my parents. They're the best. Um, <laughs> well, because I mean, the only way you get places is by going for shit, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, get getting in the water with those and then and then I had a couple long boards that I kept around and, and would use on the East Coast here and there uh, once I was back in Asheville. But, you know, Asheville is up in the mountains. You know, we're, we're four and a half to shit. We're like eight hours from the Outer Banks. So um, didn't have a lot of time for pump, that. Pump so, foiling it is, baby. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so no, it, it wasn't. I mean, that's what got me into climbing. You know, yeah. I think we have a, we have a great, uh, it's, it's a very... It's kind of like some of the roots of Southern climbing happened in Asheville, and I think that's what drew me into it. And we have a great – we don't really have um, sport climbing. That's where they like the bolts are all pre-drilled, which is kind of like the most approachable version of, of rope climbing. Um, we don't even have that. It's like it's, it's so hardcore there that like if you put a bolt in, you're going to get shamed, right? So yeah. everything's like run out, scary, trad. So that's what I that's what I learned. That's what I cut my teeth on, and so I think that's why I transitioned all the stuff in Yosemite so well is because I was already used to being scared out of my fucking mind. Yeah, that sounds scary. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad I did that in my twenties. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> when I when I didn't really know what fear was. Yeah. Do you remember when your first prone session was? First prone session. Oh yeah, definitely in Folly Beach over that COVID cycle okay. was my first prone. I mean, I think we should talk gear some. So, so you, but hold on. When when did you learn how to wing? It was just after COVID opened up, like because Puerto Rico was shut down for three it months. After, it was it March was well 16th. After COVID. Yeah, it no, was, I've been well, winging for like three seasons now. Yeah, but we were you were making. Oh, you know what? Those first boards we're you made boards. were kite foil boards, mm -hmm. and we were like locked down. So you that were living was in Ocean learned. Park. Let's talk about lockdown yeah. board co baby. So <laughs> check it out on Instagram. <laughs> I post. I put up like a little. <laughs> oh my god, it's hilarious. I, I haven't. I haven't posted anything in a while. But well, yeah, because I, like, I haven't made a board in a while. <laughs> <laughs> So I just we came up with the name Lockdown Board Co. because it started up when it was during the lockdown. We were locked down, yeah. yeah lockdown. We were shipping in carbon and whatever you yeah. could from Amazon. And mm -hmm. I have a photo of you like behind the gates, right? Locked yeah, yeah. up and you're like with your mask on in like with a tarp over you in your <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apartment yeah, 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 you were yeah. renting in Ocean Park. Yeah. Making that kite uh, that kite foil board. S still hanging in there, man. Is that it? first you still board got still that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you I haven't put... used it in a while, but yeah, yeah, but I didn't break it. But it was, it was, it was had one of no the only tracks, boards I didn't right? break. It no, was no, uh, insert. No, no, I had tracks. The first one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. red it, one? It, yeah, yeah. It had, uh, I, I bought one of those pre built uh, track boxes oh, that I was using for those right. first four From or five. From Ride board. Engine or something? Yeah, before I started yeah. building my own boxes and stuff. Um, yeah, I think I got sucked into the board building because it's. I mean, you know, I'm a home brewer well, at heart, I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if there needs to be an explaining <laughs> of why. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a nerd and I'm a yeah. home brewer and I was like, this is the I don't I'm know why you haven't been making your own foils Ugh, yet. No, I'm just kidding. That's crazy. That's maybe, maybe someday. But nah, you're right. Dude, I, I'll leave that to the pros. Yeah, it's too it's much. It's too much work. I, I do want to get back to making more boards, but it was a great journey, right? Like oh, so yeah. I it was the tactile piece that I could get a hold of and, and it would it allowed me to be a more active participant in the sport in the same way brewing, you know, allowed me to be more active in like that beer world, right? Like it's, it's that idea of crafting something that you're drinking or using. And, yeah. and I think it also helped me really understand how boards worked and what mm -hmm. the point was. I mean, it's such a cool space to be in foiling, right? Like it's like being a surfer in the sixties, right? Like everything's evolving. Nobody knows what these boards should yeah, do or I mean, how they like, work. Oh, we're just standing on it and you use it as a platform. You I mean, know? you, you then, remember those, those, Boards, yeah, from the early days. I mean, <laughs> God, they're just like planks, right? Yeah. Just barn doors that you're standing on yeah. there just have so much drag. And it was really cool to be part of, you know, seeing what doesn't work there and, and then like yeah. doing designs that move move shapes forward. And, and I think 
obviously all shapers are doing that. Um, and then, and then, you know, it's a reflection of what happens two years later in actual production, right? Like everybody's like, oh, we should pinch the tail and do this and extend whatever, yeah, you know, and then move longer track boxes and, and you know, all those things. And yeah. then now, wow, how, how have downwind boards changed everything? I mean, we, we all look at the boards we're riding right now, two years from now, fucking everything will look different yeah, yeah. because of what downwinding has showed us as far yeah, as efficiency sure. in the water and how those boards move, you know, it's really exciting <laughs> time. Yeah. It's interesting because. I mean, it depends where you are because the low, like if you're in Hawaii and, or you're here or you've got like a, sh a shaper that's experienced, that's close by, then you can start to experiment, but it's mm -hmm. expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Depends who it is. If you're doing it yourself, which you have, you know, you haven't done it in a long time, you know, space and time and Well, you know, I bought the whatever. shop, right? Like it just, yeah. yeah, I lost my space to work yeah. like a year ago and um, I've been too busy to like get the new shop set up. But I mean, I can't wait to get back in the shop and shape, especially because like, it's, it's been really cool to take a break because instead of, you know, boards that I could make, I was shaping and riding, and, and I, I've been really happy riding those boards. But now I've had a year of just buying boards from the best shapers in the world, right, yeah. and, and getting a chance to see that. So I'm definitely inspired and, and stoked to get back in the shop for sure. Yeah, because then you see what's available for the general public takes, I don't know, takes six months, eight months, a mm -hmm. year before... They can start to get on. They like, okay, we find a design, we solidify on something, the construction, get that over to a factory, start to make it, quality control, start to get the retailers to do mm -hmm. it, start to ship it out, and then, and then they start to get it out to the world, and then it's too late, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then we're on to the next, right? So winging has been, it's been insane to be part of the beginning and and see the development mm -hmm. and where it's going and how it's been moving on and how. Well, it's how you can't, right? you can't be, I mean, it's just, it couldn't have gone any faster. No. You know, like the, the development of gear and the new foils and the designers and the boards and like the way that it's been going, it's, it's crazy how, how far it's come, but it's just production, you know, production mm -hmm. and getting, getting everything into people's hands to get that feedback, to get the real life, like how it's working and, you know, what's working and, then the downwinding scene, how it's changed everything in, in terms of efficiency and what we're getting, what we want to get out of a foil and what we want to get out of a board is, it's going to be, uh, I mean, it's super exciting because from the beginning it was really exciting, but then now it's still really exciting, you know? Well, because every this year whole, you have something. Every year mm -hmm. it's crazy. and More progression. And for a, for a shop and a retailer and a school, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and that's the joy of the sport, right? It's yeah. like this this kind of never ending progression. Yeah. And I think like, you know, maybe that's this is my this is my third sports journey, right? Like I, I played basketball. Like I said earlier, I'm very one track minded. I was obsessively it's you know, it's March Madness season right now, like the NCAA tournament, yeah. huge moment for basketball. And so, you know, basketball in high school into college found that that wasn't my my fit and, you know, kind of bailed on that, found climbing full on in that now water sports and and I, I i think what i've learned through that journey is that really the joy is the progression I, and i think that's kind of why i was ready to move on from climbing and not that there wasn't more progression there but i had gotten to a level after 17 18 years of climbing where it was really hard for me to push beyond that progression like i'd gotten to a very like high level in the sport and you know the time and dedication it takes while running a company and doing all these other things to maintain that or progress yeah. You start to lose that, and then all of a sudden, you're kind of just going through the motions in the sport, and, you're, and, and it's inspiring, and it's cool to perform at a really high level. But what I realized is learning is the joy, right? That progression of, like, going out and being a little bit better all the time or finding something new, yeah. and God damn it. Like, foiling has given, given that to me in, in, like, more abundance than I yeah. could have ever imagined. And every year, I get a new sport to suck at, yeah. you know? And that's so cool. Like, downwinding, yeah. oh, my God. You know, what a journey. Yeah. What a journey. I enjoy that also, you know, but I, you know, I always want to be whatever I'm doing and whatever I'm selling or whatever, you know, I'm into or teaching. Mm -hmm. I just want to be the best at it, you mm -hmm. know, so I, I take it like head on and, and make it my mission and 
find as much time as I can to get on the water and <laughs> progress my skills. So. And it's really cool that you feel that way, knowing that you will never even be close to the best at it. You know? Oh, no. I mean, there's <laughs> uh, not, I mean, not even close. At, <laughs> at the amount of time that I have to get on the water versus everything else I have to do, running this company and doing whatever mm -hmm. and trying to find the gear and source it and sell it and making sure you have the best foils available, Walt. It's true. It's, it's a hard job, <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm always happy with my level is still improving and I'm, I'm happy with the progression. If I could spend full time on the water, I don't know. I, I don't know if I could be much better Yeah, yeah because yeah. The, the level out there is insane. And like those guys, like when we went to the, the, the race, the foil Coca race, Beach, yeah. yeah, it was like the level is just crazy at what these guys are doing, strapless and strapped and backflips and three sixties and it's just out of this world at like what you can do on a foil, and I, I don't oh, even, we're just tip of the iceberg, right? Yeah, I like, don't even what, know what if the I want to. These are. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that interests me as much as like what I'm doing because of like surfing and doing the downwinding and trying to get the runs in and trying to figure out the sport and trying to figure out our spots, right? Trying to figure out our waves. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting. Everybody has their own journey and where their progression is and where they're going with the sport and how they want to push it. Like Arlen, for instance, right? We, we started to learn how to downwind together and it was, it was mm -hmm. my mission to learn mm -hmm. how to downwind. That's what I was going to do mm -hmm. and I ended up doing it and he gave up a quarter, not even a quarter of the way. We'll say but he refocused on no, no, freestyle he re winging. He refocused on, yeah, freestyle winging, like that's his thing. I still like believe that Arlen to, will come back to no, the he'll, downwind. He'll do it 100%, you know? He can do it. He's a, he's a great Stupid foiler. good foiler, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, he didn't give up. He just, yeah. Definitely refocused. Good, good, good word choice there. You know, Walt, I'm just so trying not to be, make him, yeah, you know, man. don't cry. Arlen. <laughs> <laughs> no, he knows. He knows that I, I give him a hard time about oh, that. Oh, yeah. We whole give him thing, lots right? of shit because lots and lots of shit because we do all of that. You don't kite. I just because when I was talking to him, I know that he gets his fill of doing airs and doing freestyle from the winging side. Mm -hmm. Like that's he wants to feel progression, right? Mm -hmm. Substantially. He wants to feel like he's getting better and he's at the top of what he's doing. And uh, downwind foil, he's like, well, what do I do? I get better at runs, and then I get faster at runs? Like, what's the progression there? And I'm like, well, there is that, right? There are people that are racing. And I realized that from when we did that gorge race or whatever, mm -hmm. and I saw everyone pumping, and we were all pumping to the end and trying to finish, and it was like light, light wind, it was flat. And I got to the end, I was like, that was fun. It was like a cool experience. The, the community is awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to downwind foil race in conditions and flat water pump and you know flat water pop up and do that it feels like i'm running a marathon and i try not to do that kind of exercise <laughs> you know? like it's that's not what i want i'm i'm in it for and i'm not yeah. in it for results i'm in it for like when, when yeah when you start to do downwind and you start to feel like the sensation of how it is out there in the ocean mm -hmm. and and how you connect with it it's mm -hmm. such a different sensation to any other foil sport yeah you know you're totally connected to the foil and the swell and how that energy is is moving you and i talked about it a couple times and that's when i realized it was when i was doing a foil review of like different foils that i've that i've got mm -hmm. in the shop and i was i was like oh this foil taps into water energy a lot more like a water source of mm -hmm. energy and that's how it flows versus being powered up against a wing and there everyone has their choice, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be powered, you know, on that foil? Do you want to tap into the energy that's in the water? And I like the source of, you know, because our downwinding now, I like that source of energy from the water mm -hmm. part where that mm -hmm. foil gives me mm -hmm. that flow, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, <coughs> I, think, I think the sport, it's kind of weird. There's, there's kind of two avenues in the sport, right? And, and it's like performance trick-based things where it's like, I'm going to do a backside 360 or I'm going to do a backflip or, or whatever, front roll, it doesn't matter, right? And, and it applies to kiting and, and it applies, you know, from your background of, of like park snowboarding and things like that, right? Where there are these like tangible goals of like, I'm gonna do this maneuver until I can send it, right? And, and for some people that's a jibe or attack, right? Yeah. And for some people it's a backflip. Um, and now for some people it's like a double backflip, which is insane, right? And um, I, I think then there's like the flow state side where you're really working on, you know, how, and, and I guess there's still, tr you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of measurement of a trick, but like 
you know, when you're trying to make super hard bottom to top turns and, and really like working the wave in the right way and, and whatever. For me, those are the pieces I'm gravitating towards again, because that's what brings me more joy is like the flow of foiling and what it gives me in that like, um, I think, okay, so climbing gave me this really great thing, which... I can't, I can't hear any stories about climbing anymore. I, well, I just, I, just <laughs> I find so many, I find so many connections, man. Like, there's just so many connections between all the things you do. You. In, in any sport, right? Like, I know. You, that, that, that hyper-focus and <laughs> flow that happens, and I, I know that's uh, Eric's thing over the Progression Podcast. <laughs> but it's so true. It's like, mm. it is the joy, and, and like... Climbing, th there's like a few places that get you there, right? Like you have to have consequence and consequence, <laughs> consequence helps put you in that flow state. And like I got that in a really meaningful way from climbing, yeah. but I had to work so hard to get there and it yeah. was so short lived. Yeah. Whereas foiling somehow, like obviously the consequence is just falling off my fucking board. <laughs> or cutting your ass like Geo. <laughs> or cutting your ass like Geo. Uh, but that's more of a taco consequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I saw you taco today. It was. Did I taco today? Yeah, yeah I probably. Oh, well, we're not going to talk about <laughs> no, it. No, we're not. We're, we there's don't have no, to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We made a rule if anybody, and I'm allowed to say this out loud without having to chug. If you say, boil dry, you have to chug a beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, yeah, but, but getting into that flow state and right, like foiling puts me in that place mm -hmm. more quickly. Um, oh, now, yeah. maybe the gratification of that flow state isn't as intense, but the longevity of it, right? Yeah. Like, of how long I can stay in that connective flow state. And then, you know, surfing, definitely. Foil surfing, towing, you know, those are moments that, like, really tie you in. That's why I love winging, right? Like, you're especially being uh, on some of the breaks I've been able to spend a lot of time on. It's just like, you know, I'm catching 50 to 100 waves in a session, and, mm -hmm. and that's allowing me to stay in that place. Downwinding is, like the next extension of yeah. that, right? Of putting you in that place for a longer, longer period of time. And, um, you know, I think they're just two different paths in the sport that you can obviously bring together if, if you're incredibly skilled. And, yeah. and and then now all of a sudden people are flowing in downwinds and doing tricks and doing all kinds of crazy yeah, stuff, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I find myself, like in the in the towing, if I'm in the I'm with the right tow partner, the right conditions, you know, it's like early in the morning, like th there's, whether I'm driving the ski or I'm foiling, I'm in this kind of like in this zone. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be hyper focused and like you have, to, I'm always making sure I'm watching out for my partner. You got to tow them into the right waves. You got to be, you know, in the right spot. You want to pick them up in the right place. You want to bring them like, I don't know, in both scenarios, I feel like you've got to be focused. You know, one of the things I loved about climbing was the partner <laughs> experience. <laughs> No, for real. Right, like you're, the, the you're fired. I'm fired. <laughs> I don't know what you can do. Make I a gotta, sound. I gotta find something. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> yeah, no, but but seriously, it is one of the things I, I literally love about towing <laughs> is that it is a partner sport. Yeah. It's the only time that foiling is a partner sport, you know, because you are a hundred percent dependent on that person just like you are on your belayer and climbing <laughs> to like to keep you safe, you know? And and yeah. I think that's really magical to have no, that true. connection. And it's one of the things I've I've loved about towing since the beginning. I mean, I've towed more this winter than any winter previous and uh, I'm about towed out. I'm yeah. very ready for the east winds well, to was, kick in and start downwind. There was also a period where I was like I don't know. We towed. A lot of work. I think we towed too much, and I had I had so many ski problems. At one point, I had three jet skis for the school, and I was the maintenance man and gassing them up, and had holes in the hulls, and I was just I was so over using the jet skis in general because it felt like work, right? Mm -hmm. Every time I sat on the jet ski and I was using them, like okay, the jet ski's working. It's got the oil change. I got to gas it up, and I I felt like I was going out on a session, but I felt like that tool was my work and i don't know i just had a like a weird like a, for a couple of months i had this weird connection with towing because those were my work tools and mm -hmm. i was i've had so much trouble with them and working them so hard that i didn't i didn't really enjoy towing for a little bit because it it stressed me out of well, using you know, those jet skis great great way to ruin a good hobby is to turn it into a job <laughs> that's all i've ever done <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, the yeah. only yeah, thing me, I know. Me, me too. Yeah, you're like, I love drinking beer. Let's make beer. Let's make a brewery. <laughs> oh, God. No, I 11 love years boards. later. Let me make boards. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying yeah. very hard to not fuck this one up. <laughs> yeah. And not make it my job, you know? And uh, Yeah, no, it, it's very interesting. Like, you have to have an interesting balance. And I'm, I'm glad that I still have this love relationship with all these water sports that I do because, but it also. You, you can know, do both. You can, yeah, you can definitely do. I still do, love beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and wine. It, yeah, and wine, yeah. Um no, I think it I think it fuels it in a certain way because if I didn't love it, I mean why would why would you why would you have a kite school in a shop if you don't love it? It's not it's not doing anything. Exactly. <laughs> it's not doing anything for you. Um other than like, yeah, if, if I love it, then at least I can stay on top of it. And I, I try to find the trends and what gear, you know, is coming out and what's what's happening. And I, 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 I feel like because of you as well, that I was in the right place at the right time, you know, and it, and it fueled certain brands. And I kind of merged and I moved and I, you know, switched to different things. And and it worked really well for me. And, uh, you know, like. Yeah, I, I think it's like good. Let's talk. Your, let's talk gear, man. Gear, let's get in. Let's your get nerdy. Gear, your gear journey is your gear journey is the shop's gear journey. Well, we've been on a journey together. And that's our journey. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, sick. for sure. So, you learned how to kite, <laughs> foil, and you had that slingshot stuff. Yeah. And then we quickly moved on into winging, and then winging became well. No, the I got only I got thing. some I got some lift gear. Remember, like first of all. Talk about some sexy fucking gear, right? Like the lift for kiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, oh. the old school classic 175. Yes. Is that what it was? No, no, it was a 170 no. surf. 170. Yeah, was... I don't I can't remember. Yeah, 170 surf. But it wasn't a surf. It was like their classic wing, right? Oh, like it, was it was the classic. It was one piece. Yeah, one piece. Yeah, I st I have one of those. Yeah, yep. that was that was like my first full carbon kit, and because mm -hmm. I mean, quickly it's like. I'm on this aluminum shit. Like, yeah, I need some carbon. Like, look how sexy that's. Well, and, and it was all like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't deal with aluminum. Stuff. Well, I mean, says the guy who rides no limits <laughs> all the time, and it's like uh, the bane you of gotta, my the aluminum <laughs> connections well, are the bane of my existence. Well, I mean, I love them. You've got to take care of that. Yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's worth it because it's true. Masks when, are great. But when people come in, they're like, "Oh, what's the advantage? And what's this and that?" And I'm like, "Oh, if you want this advantage because it's faster, mm -hmm. stiffer, or whatever, but you do have to maintain it more." Mm -hmm. Like there is a little bit of a maintenance required for having gotta these aluminum pieces, gear. you know. You gotta love your gear, gotta you know. Your gear. You gotta, you gotta caress but with the, the gear. with the full carbon stuff, I mean, I don't wash anything anyway. Like or yourself. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I took a shower like last like week. waist yeah. down. No, oh. after our session today, I went nice. home. I took the hose and. <laughs> washed myself <laughs> yeah, yeah no but, but no you gotta yeah you gotta gear. maintain it but the lift gear was yeah beautiful right awesome. like i mean i saw your setup and i was like man that's what i i want a full carbon kit so i got that and i think one of the things that lift did from an early uh early places they really looked at aesthetics right like in mm -hmm. construction and how they had the the you know kind of monoblock fuselage and front wings and um, I just think that was really appealing to me from, you know, marketing is a big piece of my world and branding. And like, I just love the aesthetic. I still love the aesthetic of what they produce. I think it's some of the most beautiful gear. And, uh, so I rode that. And then from there, uh, Nick put out the 120, which was just mind blowing, but yeah. so far beyond where I was from a skill set standpoint. Yeah. I mean, that was like, that foil is still so insane i was just riding it the other day i was towing with uh dale from uh pr, PR surf surfing. adventures yeah. one of the most frothy epic dudes you will ever yeah. meet <laughs> tow with him all the time i love that guy so much yeah uh but yeah i was riding his kit and yeah i mean the <clears throat> the, the foils just it's okay so foilings on this hyper speed right like this foil is what three years old and it's like archaic you know because yeah, like still. anything that was three years ago just would normally but that 120 is still such an insanely relevant foil yeah. and uh, anyways i was a little overwhelmed by the high aspects that that lift put out and i was trying to ride them and then armstrong you know they have the cf range and and whatever and the construction was really the hs great. H, oh, sorry hs yeah we, we went on we went on the hs we went on the hs right yeah and so we got on those hs's uh what was it 1050 was the one we were riding a yeah. lot at that point 1050 12 1250 1250 for, for, for proning and then 1050 and 850 for like surfing yeah. and, and or winging and towing yeah. um and those like all of a sudden it was like it allowed me to feel more surfy more comfortable more stable obviously didn't have the glide didn't have the pump yeah but 
I was able to control it. I yeah. was able to like make the, I could see the move in my, my head and I could actually make it happen. Whereas the, the lift foils were just beyond my skill set. Yeah. And then I kind of pushed through that and then came back to lift and had this really great journey of like rediscovering the 120 at the same moment that the 90 and the 70 and all those things came out. And so I got to yeah. enjoy that progression of, of foils and those foils made me better. Like they pushed me to be a better rider to, to be able to ride them. And you know, now I'm writing code, which has been a really great journey and kind of, I think, found the sweet spot of like what I want out of a foil. Um, and obviously very focused on downwind where a lot of my focus is these days. So yeah. I think that was a lot of my transition there. I mean, we got to meet the guys in Hood River during our, our trip last summer and, uh, you know, hopped on those things and it just felt great. And so I was obviously frothing and waiting just like you were for them to ship you the first load of foils and yeah. uh, been on that journey since. But I don't know. I love gear. I love all gear. Oh, yeah. Takuma was in there. We rode Takuma yeah. for a well, while. So you went on the arms, the Armstrong stuff. We also rode the high aspects, right? That 925. Oh, I forgot the 925. Yeah, the duh. 925 was epic, right? Oh, so the epic. 11. I don't know it was 1125 or something. We it was mm -hmm. like their first high that aspect. That's when I learned man. how to prone on. Mm -hmm. That 925 was awesome. That was the, the 725 was. Then I towed that. Then it was, it was like, like a much, 500. Yeah. It was just too much. And then, yeah, then we switched to Takuma. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, because we tried, uh, you know, everybody because was frothing it, on Takuma. It was because so that nine, different. That nine, uh, what was it? 980. Nine, 980. It had I, know, this, I always loved that the code 980 and that were 980. Yeah. So I'm like, at least one number that I don't have to fucking learn twice, yeah, I you know. know. I can remember All these it. numbers in my head. Yeah. yeah, that 980 had the glide. It had the pump and had it had the, the surf. Pump and the surf. And I mean, then it, it was had, crazy. It had the sharp winglets that went through my hand. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Th a lot of fun. Well, I think we've moved on from like armor piercing winglets <laughs> yes. in in the foil sports, right? <laughs> like I think so. things have kind of progressed to where we're like we probably shouldn't kill people. I mean, yeah. So Dylan's referring to when he fell on the 980, and if anybody had a Takuma in those early days, like it was like the factory that made them, and and you know. Incredible front wings, horrible connections, right? Yeah. Like the fuselage and shit was all fucked, but those yeah. front wings were Their so good. And the tails were good. The the wing, the, yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, the thing. foils were good. Foils were great. And, uh, but it was like it was, like it was made in, in the mold, and then somebody just took a chop saw and like <laughs> cut. And it was, it was the sharpest yeah, was fucking so sharp. point ever. You could, you're like, you could put your thumb on it and like, oh, look at these winglets. And you'd like rub your thumbs on the corners, and you're like, wow, that. That almost cut or, me. Or you could fall on it and shove it all well, the way through the meat it. of it your It's good that it was my hand and not my face. Because yeah. I, like, tacoed on it, and I put my hand out, and it went straight through my hand uh, three stitches later. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. if that was Geo, it would have come out of his shoulder. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> oh. Anyways, foiling's super safe. Everybody should get into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, the, I've only had one injury, honestly. I've hit my head a few times, like, towing, like, the mast or whatever, mm. like... Being in the wish wash. But we wear helmets now. I wear helmet all the time. Anytime now. I foil. Now. Even even when I downwind, except for the last time. It was too oh, hot. Just recently. It was too hot. I think I, I, think I, I disagree with maybe the helmet downwind. Maybe it's, it's a, little a little bit overkill. excessive. But yeah. I did it a couple times. It was extremely hot. You look like a fucking bobblehead out there. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's but, great. It's too hot. I mean, I can't yeah, even for, wear the life vest. For here towing and winging so and whatever, I, I definitely wear a helmet, mm -hmm. which I feel safer. I don't I don't know if I hit my head that much to be honest but yeah i've been so. rocking the bump cap for <clears throat> two years and then i just transitioned that's to a good one a gaff helmet yeah, which you, i really like i wear a hat all the time mm -hmm. i always have a hat in the car you get a bump cap it's like four bucks on amazon yeah definitely just get one throw it in your hat it's it'll sk save at least your skull mm -hmm. you know if something like bumps into the top of your head or the side of your head like a bump cap is a great one yeah, high yeah. speed impact is like you need a helmet, you know. But yeah. for most of what foiling is, it's more about like yeah, stopping that sharp thing from cutting your skin, and the bump yeah. cap definitely achieves that. So yeah, I, I would definitely suggest that to folks. I think safety um, is progressing in the sport. And it's really cool to see because you know you look at snowboarding, for example. Not, not granted, we're falling in the water, but we have some dangerous items around. I, th I think it's cool to mm -hmm. see the progression of impact vests and helmets and things like that. Because I don't know, I just want people to crush it and not be injured yep. you know uh, maybe we're gonna have to get like kevlar shorts so geo doesn't get a foil in the butt <laughs> this is great not. that geo was the the <laughs> episode before this because we get to talk about his <laughs> yeah. butt so much in this episode <laughs>
Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, I need a glass then to pour it. Yeah. But then it just sounds like you're taking a piss. Yeah. <laughs> according according <laughs> to the generic <laughs> pork <laughs> float <laughs> podcast, guys. That's Speaking the only... of, congrats on the shout out. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's Those guys cool. are hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was super cool. I was super stoked to to have a five minute little segment on their on their podcast. I don't know how many viewers or listeners they have, but I I listen to every single episode they've got, and I'm a I'm a fan. They they talk a lot of crap, but they have a good vibe. Yeah, they've got a good vibe. Healthy they have a, shit talking. Yeah, yeah. Good. They've him and Freddie have a like Liam and Freddie have a good connection, and they've got a good flow between them. So yeah, it was pretty cool to to have a shout out and. Uh, you know, that they, well, let's see if they listen to any of our other episodes. <laughs> <laughs> he listened to one of them, which is, you know, which is cool. But yeah, I, I, it was, uh, it was interesting to see their take on it. So for sure, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I want to, I want to talk about downwinding. Who doesn't want to <laughs> talk about downwinding, right? Uh, because it was a very special journey for me. Um, I, I think I learned everything so easily like in general, kiting, kiting, whatever. I was 16 years old and you know, that, that was just, I had so much time and that's mm -hmm. all I wanted to do. I, like months and months before I learned how to kite, I knew I wanted to kite. Like that's mm -hmm. what I was doing. That was mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. So it wasn't a shock that I immersed myself into it. And then, you know, kiting forever and then kite foiling, it took me one session to learn how to do it. And then winging, it took me a while to learn how to wing it. What, what? I appreciate the humbleness when it came to winging. <laughs> well, winging, yeah, it took me it took me a while because I had horrible gear, and even when I had when I got that like a hundred and thirty liter um, wing board or whatever, and the COVID opened up the beaches, it still took me a couple sessions to learn how to foil, and I was shocked because I was I I felt like I was such a good foiler because mm. I'd been foiling, I've done foil races, I knew how to tack, I was I was. I felt like I was really good at foiling, so I'm like, oh, this is nothing. All I have to do is hold this wing in my hand, and mm -hmm. it wasn't as easy as I thought. So it took me, you know, a good three three downwind sessions to get up on foil and, and start to feel it out. Mm -hmm. And it was a 130-liter board, which downwind is... Downwind winging, yeah. Or, yeah, whatever, yeah. just doing a downwinder yeah, 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 on the yeah, wing. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. learning how to wing, the old, I went down. The old walk of shame. Oh, yeah, I've, I've I had a bunch of those. And you still have those, which is wild. Because mm -hmm. sometimes... People are like, oh, well, <laughs> what should I learn or what's easier? And I, I get that question all the time. And some, it's hard because when you launch a kite on the beach, you feel the power of the kite. And you're like, yeah, it's, it's enough for me to ride. Or you could, mm -hmm. you could tack out, you could tack in, and you're flying the kite. Unless it falls and like, there's no wind or whatever, you get dragged in the shore break. That's a disaster and that sucks. But if you're flying the kite and you try to tack out and tack in, I don't understand why you wouldn't try all you do is walk up with the kite and it's done. But winging, you go out there and you're like, you hold the wing in your hand on the beach. You're like, you pump it on the beach. You're like, yeah, it's enough yeah. wind. And Let then you go out and you've got the wrong size foil or not enough leaderage on your board or not the right size wing. And then there's current. And then you're trying to get up and you're like, I, I still have horrible sessions sometimes winging. Like you just oh, it literally happened to me horrible gear ago. choice. Yeah, we were, we were at, you know, down in Rincon and... Wind was cranking and Trace was at 10 foot. And I'm like, this is my moment. I can go out there and wing. And I paddled way out. And I had my, you know, 720 and my sinker, sinker wing board, my four meter. Nothing, dude. Nothing. Oh. Wind got light. I had to paddle half a mile over, over and, then, and then walk out over Urchin Reef. It was great. Ouch. You know, so yeah, you're right. It, it's, it's not like kiting where, you, you know, the kite's loaded up and you know you've got the power to go do yeah. what you want to do. Whereas winging, it's like kind of like, it, you know, especially if it's offshore or in any kind of unique conditions that you're trying to get to, it can be very challenging. Yeah, because if you can't launch the kite on the beach, you know there's not enough wind. Mm -hmm. But you're like, oh, it feels breezy. You know, I'm a, oh, I'm going to try. You know, I've got, oh, I've got the skills. I've got the foil. And you're mm -hmm. like, you go out there and, man, I've, I've definitely gone a couple miles downwind before I've gotten up on foil. And I've gotten up on foil because I am not. Walking back. Not walking back. I am not walking back. Oh, I've seen it, dude. I've, I've seen had a you couple do it. of those. Where Dylan's um, out there literally <laughs> trying to get on foil for like 45 minutes, <laughs> just drifting out to Condado, like out in the distance. And then all of a sudden you'll see him get on foil and make it back finally. But it's just like, and then you'll know, do it. I'm like, oh, it's good. I'm up on foil. I feel power. And you do attack and you fall. And I'm like, okay, again. 
Like, yeah, you'd have to yeah. for me, I would have been like, dude, I would have just swam to shore and said, fuck it. Yeah, so the downwinding was, it was intense. Well, sucking at winging really <clears throat> prepares you for how much you're going to suck at downwinding, yeah. right? And I, yeah. I think that, like, winging was that unique moment where, like, it was that much more challenging and that much more frustrating. I think in those early days of winging, especially, everybody has those those conversations of, like, man, I went out there and I... Okay, great example. Chris uh, Sizemore, who's a really good prone foiler, got into winging, and he was just like, man, like, such a good foiler, but so frustrated when he got out there winging, right? And, like, never cursed so much, you know? Like, I, I think that you have those moments of, like, hyper-frustration where you're just, you're cursing but the it fucking also, heavens, But right? it also depends if you come from a sailing background or not. Yeah, the like, wind sports thing helps. Wind for sports sure. for sure like help. Like help. knowing how to kite and mm -hmm. knowing the angle of the wind and knowing where your resistance is and knowing how to tack and where you're like having that awareness makes a huge difference. You know, sailing, kiting, windsurfing, whatever, going into the to the winging. Mm -hmm. If you have no wind sports at your back, but you're only a foiler, proning or an e-foiler, you know, <laughs> it's it it yeah. becomes a lot more frustrating mm -hmm. because there's this other, you know there's this whole other dimension to it. Well, it's just that inability, right? Yeah. Like where you're like, I know I'm capable. And then like, I have this inability to perform or to like, just even start the sport, right? Like just that powering up thing. And I think that's what downwinding, that's the frustration in downwinding, right? Like you go out there and you have that same moment you have with winging it. And I really do feel like the struggle of winging and those moments of kind of uh, just where you feel completely unable to perform that because of conditions or whatever, like kind of sets you up for like the, the struggle that's very real and downwinding. Yeah. And I know there's all these other platforms, one that I can't speak of, uh, that help you kind of progress into it or be able to do it, <laughs> <laughs> do it earlier. But, you know, I think the struggle is real for, for a reason. And, yeah. and like you have to overcome that. Yeah. And that's part of the joy of the journey is like overcoming that struggle, like going out yeah. there and having six, eight, 10, 15 sessions where like you're barely able to get on foil and then all of a sudden you pop up and you ride a quarter mile and then you ride a half a mile, right? And, and then yeah. all of a sudden you have this feeling of flow and connectivity and it is wild, right? Like just like winging or anything, especially downwinding where it feels incredibly impossible and then that right little nugget comes and you pop up and it feels so easy and flawless yeah. and, 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 and purposeful, right? So. Yeah, I mean, downwinding has been a really impressive journey, which I'm not even close to the end of, right? I, I think yeah. I'm still just peeking behind the curtain of, like, what downwinding is going to give me. I mean, honestly, part of it's been on the West Coast this winter. It's, it's very challenging. We don't have a lot of protected coves and, and like, bays like you guys have over here in, in San Juan. So there's, like, once swell gets above five foot, there's not really anywhere to come in. A lot of our runs go around the point and it's like heavy shore break. And so I, I've really downwinded very little this winter and I cannot fucking wait for the winds to, to, to kind of shift in and for us to get more consistent winds. And obviously I'm, I've got all kinds of travel this summer to Hood River and Maui that I'm yeah. planning to, to spend a lot of time um, downwinding because it's, you know, again, to progress in the sports the way I would like to, I, I, you gotta put yourself in the spots, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's funny that you say that because when we were learning how to downwind in the summer, all it is is wind swell, right? Yeah. And we get amazing wind in the summer. May, June, July, mm -hmm. August, it's windy every mm -hmm. single day, 16 to 22 knots on average, and it's all wind swell. So by the afternoon, it's good. Mm -hmm. And we're like, damn, I can't wait till the winter when we get swell, swells. And mm -hmm. it really picks up. And it's honestly not the case mm -hmm. you know in the winter it, it just gets really blown up there's mm -hmm. swell directions come from different ways because we get all these norths from the northwest and we get all these like we get a bunch of different swells and like it's not it's not that impressive for a downwinder but that said I gotta, I gotta give a shout out to roy and and Gio and, and the whole crew, I mean, they've been charging all winter, right? Like, they've yeah. been sending in really heinous conditions and, and getting some really 
really uh, impressive sends and then some really magical sends, I'm no, sure, I mean, in that. We, you know? we had one a week ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were on that chat. Yeah. You know, you were super jealous. Crying. Yeah, you were crying. <laughs> we had like no wind. It was like blowing was maybe like weird. five to 10 and it's yeah. blowing like 20 plus over here. And it was that happens epic. a lot and on we, this island, which yeah. is weird. When you get that, that southeast, right? We get yeah. that southeast and then all of a sudden that west point is just, it's like the dead zone, right? It's like where the draft is. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, we had, it was amazing and the swell was up and, you know. Yeah, you I said best downwind run ever. Yeah, best downwind. I, I mean, I've had in a long time. Mm -hmm. It was hard because every downwind I run know. you do and you finish dry and you do 10 miles on foil is the best run ever. But it was pretty epic. It was just felt really good to get out there and, and be out there and be connected to the swell and it'd be so big. And I, I, I was telling, I was telling Gio the same thing. Like when you feel like you're dropping into a 10 foot, exactly a 10 footer while you're towing, but you're out there on a paddle board, like you feel like you're holding on, mm -hmm. you know, just like, and you're dropping into Nothing's something like that. It's insane. It's insane. It's crazy. Yeah. To, where you're just maxing feel out that. The you're foil. maxing out the mm -hmm. foil and you're just, holding on and you're just gliding over swell to swell to swell to connect mm -hmm. to another bump. But mm -hmm. you feel like, I feel like when I'm towing, I don't know, like I feel like I'm holding on more then on my downwinder than I am when I'm towing into a mm -hmm. 10 foot or, mm -hmm. or whatever. It's just, it's crazy that well, you, those rollers we get feels. here are massive too. Yeah. You know, like you, you do get the foils are different, speed, right? So you could, you could put on a huge foil and feel like you're dropping into a 10 <laughs> yeah. footer and at, at 10 miles an hour. I mean, you guys are on so. 700s, 800 yeah. foils. I mean, those are yeah. not big foils at this point. You know, and I think they handle speed really well. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think, look, the gear to, to get into downwinding at the beginning has been really cool. And, and I think, you know, we're a year behind the actual sport, maybe two years behind, like, the For Maui, sure. yeah, the yeah, Maui yeah. progression of, like, what Dave and the team and the, and the guys are doing over there. Yeah. Um, but... You know, just looking at board design and the changes that are happening in the next year here, foil design, uh, you know, where the high aspects are going, the 13 aspect ratio foils yep. and how those sections look and the amazing performance we're getting out of these incredibly high aspect foils that have like crazy low end, crazy high end. Yeah. Carvability. Great efficiency. Yeah. You know, they pump great. Yeah. They feel stable. I mean where are the foils going to go? Obviously everything gets better, but yeah. to be there compared to what you would have had to ride to do the exact same thing two to three years ago is like, I mean, it's night and day. It'd be like driving a Ford pickup versus a Ferrari, you know? Yeah. And I think that now that we're seeing that, I think this next year, this is the year of downwind. This is the year where it goes berserk, right? Yeah. Like I think we all saw it. I think everyone we all got started, to touch it yeah. last year. Now we're all going to be deep in it. And like the reach is going to go further. Cause there, it is endless. The amount of runs that are out there, the ocean possibilities are endless. You will never be crowded. I mean, you wish you could be closer to people when you're downwind. Yeah. You know, we I go wish with, I had. We go out with five people and I see nobody. And I mean, depends. Like I fall or he falls or he gets up early. We're like, we're going. And maybe you'll, I'll see them in a the distance and then you'll catch up or they'll be way out mm -hmm. a quarter of a mile this way, mm -hmm. a quarter mile that way. And yeah, it's you wish that you could downwind with yeah. more people, like you could session with your friends, but it's, it's kind of like you're, you're on your own, buddy. Yeah. yeah, and I think, I think for people who are like watching the videos and looking at it, maybe you're a winger or whatever, and you're thinking about getting into it, it's like, it's an amazing journey, but you've got to be committed to the journey. Yeah, very dedicated. Yeah. You got to be dedicated to the journey. You and got to be willing <laughs> to like take the suck. You know, yeah. you know it's going to be challenging. You got to go out there consistently. And, and it is one of those things where like, if you're not in somewhere that has like epic conditions all the time, un unlike winging, like winging, I would say don't go out unless it's blowing over yeah, 15 yeah, yeah, yeah. and whatever. Downwinding, you just need to go out. You yeah. just need to go, just go out, out and do suffer it and experience it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just do it and do it and do and it and do it. And eventually it starts to click and then it rolls. And then once you get better, then you go, now I want to be a little more selective about my yeah. conditions. Cause you know, I exactly. could go winging or I could go proning because it really isn't lining up today. But in those early days, until you get it, you got to just put the work in. Except when it's huge. <laughs> Except when it's huge. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to go double, triple black diamond, you yeah. know, just pick those. Yeah. Those green runs, those bunny mm -hmm. runs, the blue runs, it's blowing 12 knots. It's mm -hmm. blowing 13 knots. That's it doesn't perfect. matter. That's that's when you learn the most. It's kind of a misconception, right? Because yes. you think you need you're like, speed and energy and oh, power. Oh, it's 25 knots. The swell's six to seven foot. And you're like, that's when I want to learn how to downwind. You're like, that's when it's going to be the most, the hardest to, 
keep on that swell, to outroll that swell, depends on the, the and it's very well, equipment there's a reason, based as well. There's a reason the best riders in the world are now riding like nine foot boards, right? So, I mean, they're riding those because of how intense those conditions are that they're in, that they need such a long needly board to like keep the board speed up and obviously get up smaller foils, but you got to get up smaller foils to keep up with the bumps, right? Yeah. Like you go out, I learned on the Takuma 1440, yeah. An incredibly amazing foil to learn to paddle up on. It gets yeah. up. It It's incredibly easy to control for how big the foil is. It yeah. surfs great. But I was, I was it's looking slow. at it. Dude, like, it's so slow. I was looking at the details, and I think it's like a 7.9 or oh, it's, AR, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aspect it's, a, ratio. it's a surf foil. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just a giant but it, surf foil. It pops foil. up at very low speeds. It does glide re- like decently well for its size. And someone came into the shop to learn, like, I want to learn how to downwind. And I still have those 1440s up on the wall. Because they're probably the best foil to wear. And I ordered them especially because of that. I was like, Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of brands that have that entry level, like where you're going to go and to learn how to downwind. And that was, that was one of them. Those those 1440s are, yeah, it was, it was good to, to Mm -hmm. learn on, to pop it up. And I would say, yeah, for sure. But it's tough. It's tough in, in deep, deep water. Like, like we we have here, right? Like, they perform really well in wind swell and like shallower. I think like if you're on the east coast, you know, and, and you're looking at, at some of those uh, those bumps rolling through there. But when you get to these deep water bumps where the periods are longer and, yeah. and they're moving faster, they're impossible. To well, keep you're up just with, gonna right? keep backing up, keep backing up, yeah. keep backing mm-hmm. up, and and that's what I had with a bunch of foils that I learned on is that I re- realized because you were on that what the North 1450, right? I to learned start? on the yeah the high aspect 1450, mm-hmm. which is fast. Pretty it fast. goes fast. Yeah. Um, and then, but it wasn't easy enough to pop up. No, no, it doesn't have a good low. You no, know, it doesn't have a good low end for how big it is. Mm-hmm. But it was fast, so I could keep up with it. It had really good glide, so I backed up, and then I went on the twelve thirty SF, which is their surf foil, mm-hmm. which I can flat water start that thing. But I, one day I went up on it. I'm like, damn, I can flat water start this thing. It's going to be great. And I got up and I I did a run from Caballos to La Ocho. Mm-hmm. It's I don't know, seven miles, eight mm-hmm. miles or whatever. And I was so exhausted backing up off the yes, swell and exactly. backing up off the swell. And ba- mm-hmm. Like it just would not glide enough to keep up with what the swell was doing that I was, I was burning myself out, pumping it. And I could come down to almost like, I don't know, like to a stop and pump it and keep it pumping and keep on mm-hmm. foil, which was totally fine. But I just, it was exhausting pumping it and and leaving off the swell and pumping and leaving mm-hmm. off the swell. So I realized then that I was like, nah, great that I can pop it up and, and I can flat water start it, but it, it just didn't didn't match up for what I needed for downwinding. So it's part of the progression, I think. You know, I, yeah. I kind of had a similar journey where I learned on the 1440. Um, I learned here in Puerto Rico, and then we, we took kind of the, the Puerto Rico crew trip with, you know, Randy and Roy and... Uh, you and me and, and whatever to, to Hood River and um, that was an epic experience and and all of a sudden now I was in better conditions and I was I was riding the Takuma still I had the 1095 that uh, well my old 1095 which I actually uh, had gifted to Emily yeah. <laughs> uh, which I borrowed back so I could use <laughs> took that to Maui um, and then from there I got on to uh, well I was in Maui I picked up. Um, from Mark Rappaport, who's the built amazing boards, which I have one of his boards right now, was Flying Dutchman and SIC, and um, I, I do think the boards matter a lot, right? Like I, I, equipment, I'm 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 definitely always maybe it's because I'm not as as good as everybody else. I'm always chasing like what is the what's the best edge, right? Yeah, and, I, and I think I we're told all, uh, I don't know who I said it to, but I was like, if it makes me five percent better, I'm getting it. Exactly. If it makes me two <laughs> percent better, I'm getting it, yes. right? So I mean, the board matters a lot, and and Mark makes incredible boards, but he also sells Axis foil. So I I got the the twelve oh one which is actually like a 13, because Axis is the most confusing shit ever. I mean, I, I love I, the barrier to entry I and know. foiling is like, how good are you at remembering numbers and the equivalent of like square inches to centimeters to span or whatever. And when we people listen to us talking about foils, they must think we are just like accountants or insane, <laughs> right? We're just rambling I, numbers. I, I know all these numbers, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the only, yeah, I, I said it before, the only brand I really don't know much about is Axis because mm-hmm. I know that I don't know their numbers are span mm-hmm. versus actual area and yeah I saw why? this dude out the other day he was why? on a Spitfire oh, 
fuck, I don't even know, 10 something. But I was like, oh yeah, 10, whatever, it's a thousand. I was like, wait a second, that could be like a 1400. I don't even know. <laughs> yes. you know? Like, but yeah, I, I got on the art pros and, and they were really insanely different, right? Like I went from these like slow moving, low end Takumas to these like super fast and Kai, Kai race, Kai race, the whatever, the, the, one thousand one or whatever they have in okay. the in the M two O last year, you know, like they're incredible foils. They're really built for downwinding. Um, so I use those for a just little can't bit. Turn them. You just yes, my t the twelve oh one the span was just too much. I didn't know what to do. I'd never ridden a foil like that, right? Like I'd always <coughs> been on these surfy foils, and for me to go to that, it was weird. I got worse riding it at first. Eventually, like it made me better. I think that's what Geo had. Mm -hmm. Geo had it. Had so Geo had that. He had the same and then experience. he moved over to something to the way smaller, on yeah. like a 980 code. Mm -hmm. It had because way it, more because success. Because it was all we could get, you know. Yeah. And I had the same experience, you know. Yeah. And then I think I finally, and it's part of the journey, right? Like you kind of have these bigger wings. And the 1201 was the first time I had a big wing that could also move me forward and I could actually keep up with bumps. I didn't have to chase back as much. Like I was able to like stay on those, you know, stay on those bumps a little bit longer and milk them a little bit more. Whereas like when I was riding those slower Takumas, I was always getting pushed off, right? Like it never gave me the ability to like milk the milk that bump and, and get to the next one and really be efficient. Um, and now, you know, progressing down to the, the code 860 uh, high aspect that I'm riding now, I mean, it was it was it was a real game changer because now I've got that ability to go forward or go backwards, right? I can yeah. I can look through the bumps and I can put myself where I need to be, and I can also turn when I want. And coming yeah. from a surfing background, like carving feels more natural. Like I want to carve through the bumps a little bit more than I just want to like point and chase. So I think it's all about like you know what's your what's your skill set, what's your direction. But I, I do think there is kind of this learning curve where you've got to understand until you can get to those smaller foils, you're probably going to be chasing chasing bumps backwards mm -hmm. unless you're in wind swap. You're in Hood River or maybe you're in the southeast and you're getting small, like, wind-driven swell that's, like, tighter period. And, you know, then you can kind of sit in those bumps because they're not moving so fast. But when you come out to these, like, 8, 10, 12-second period you know, swells that we get out here. I mean, they're moving so fast that yeah. you're just, you're hanging you on for your life. Yeah. Yeah. But it's cool. But it's cool. It's all part of the journey. And that's where I think, again, 10% of my way through this journey and downwinding. I, I'm so excited for summer. Yeah. 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 It's you've got a pretty her. great summer lined up. Hell yeah. Hopefully I'm going to join you. You better. One of those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm going to be uh, trying to line up that trip coming to Hawaii um august fresh off the baby dude yeah fresh, baby in tow fresh baby cooking right now that's right um due in june june yeah. yeah 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 and then and then you know have a little home time baby time hot and ready hot and ready <laughs> and then straight to hawaii yeah it'll be dope um, it'll be dope i can't wait weeks. for you to, i can't wait for you to get yeah, there yeah i hope you're that gonna, lines you're up you're gonna kill it man it's gonna be great and you know the whole the whole crew's right gonna be there yeah Insane. Roy and Gio and and, uh, and so Nikki. I want to like I talked about it. I want to have them one by one on the pod, Got to. and then all of us together. I don't know how messy that would be. Oh, it's, it's gonna be very messy. Our chats are a little bit going. They're going sideways sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody wants to donate to Mickey's fund, we have a GoFundMe so he can you know buy a boil drop. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I, I took it down. So, so the, oh, back, the, ba the background on this is, oh, I, yeah, he, Mickey, hilarious. Mickey talks some serious shit and I love it. And, well, and the, he's giving the, us look, all the only, the only reason he talks shit is because he's incredible. Yeah. It's because <laughs> he's like, the, he's the OG. He's, he's the, the daddy, downwind dude. OG master, you know, like he's been doing he's downwinders been downwinding on the, since the beginning. He's been downwinding. When they were downwinding in Hawaii, he was trying to downwind here in yeah. Puerto Rico, yeah. like when he's they were been, just starting it. Yeah. But foiling, yeah, but he's been downwinding on like SUPS. Oh, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like dude, before, he was, before I was born, probably. Dude, he was downwinding before we had <laughs> boards over like six foot to downwind on. You know, he mm -hmm. was telling me his stories of like trying to downwind on like whatever, uh, 6 0 by 24, whatever, yeah. just block of foam trying to paddle up yeah. and just suffering. It was actually cool. I was out in the lineup the other day, and uh, Mike Leeson was telling me a story about, you know, about six, seven years ago when they were making a lot of race downwind boards um, mm -hmm. for just paddle 
paddling. Um, Extremely sexy boards. Yes. MHL custom. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful Back in boards, the day. right? Yeah. And uh, and obviously they were making the kite foils. Then he yep. basically took one, you know, just as as the Malagoys did, and put tracks in a downwind board. And he had like a fourteen footer that he put tracks in and 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 strapped like. A 110 kite foil to and did like wow. a downwinder from uh, shacks to the wall and he got it up on foil for wow. like for like he said it was maybe like 30 seconds or something and uh and but it, but it was so brutal and so hard he was like i don't know i don't i don't think this has a future you know and 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 That's had to get crazy. out of the wall and walk his 14 foot board two miles back <laughs> to his house right um so i mean there's there's these guys kind of always have been pushing it on gear that that didn't really make sense right yeah, and, and i think you, you hear those stories from dave and and yeah. the guys where they looked at foils and said ah i don't know you know they were they they took the air chair they strapped it to a surfboard they hucked themselves into <laughs> these bombs at jaws and said yeah. okay i guess this is what foiling is <laughs> yeah and and then and you know it took that kind of evolution of i don't know i've listened to the podcast and i don't want to just give kai the credit but a bunch of guys and kai who were yeah. kind of pushing like this innovation in foiling and then they applied it to smaller waves and, and then look where we are now right so um it's it's cool they, thank you gotta, god man gotta throw some respect to those guys you I know have like the, i don't have pioneers, the time to, try to pioneer something like that i'm glad i can get on the back of that and me too and help you know like figure it out uh, yeah. after people have experienced that i don't have the mental capacity to yeah <laughs> to do that yeah i've never been um, part of pioneer i've been <clears> part of like pushing kind of that like second wave or yeah, third yeah, wave. Yeah, yeah, like that's sure. what I've always been able to be a part of is like seeing something and being like, okay, now I'm in on the second or third wave and or I get seeing the chance to be push like, it. Wow. That could be something, mm -hmm. you know, and like jumping on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah but downwinding, that. I think downwinding is a portal to like another universe in foiling, you know, it really <laughs> is. And, and I, I think that what comes next, you know, what comes next is, is very exciting. What, what a cool sport to be in. What a cool time to be in it, you know, like the, the, the limitless possibilities of foiling, right? Like there's endless breaks, there's endless places we can go do this sport. And then, you know, people are finding ways to apply this technology to all kinds of expansions of, of the sport, right? Like we've, yeah. we've been able to start with proning, get into winging and now downwinding and I can't say it, but you know, what does that do? And, and I mean, the e-foil too, like look at the e-foil, right? Like what, yeah. what is the future of the e-foil? I mean, you know, Nick's development of that technology, whatever, five years ago or, or however long the e-foil has been around. Yeah. I mean, where does that go as technology increases? I mean, that guy works so fucking hard on innovation. I mean, he's yeah. got new foils he's testing. He's got new versions of, of uh, the e-foil that, you know, being around shacks, I get to see stuff that they're testing all the time where does it go you know yeah. and and what is it what is it we could look back on the sports we're doing right now and it, we may be on it right we, we could be five years we could be beyond like what we're doing and completely into some other you know segment of foiling that we never would have imagined so it's a really cool sport to be in and um maybe this is kind of like getting a little over the top for the, end of the interview but i think that's the magic of this thing is like this kind of endless possibilities of foiling it. and where it's going to take us i was supposed to get that magic button like foil magic. Well, this is the problem. This is why I look forward to my next interview on episode 35 not, where I'm you've just, got more buttons. I know. I'm just not good enough at this whole development thing. I'm just like, what are we going to do? Like, Well, let's chit chat and drink beer. That's I think we're doing a good job. That's good enough. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be wild where this where the sport goes and the people that are behind it, pushing it mm -hmm. and, you know, foilers making foils for Foilers, you know, yeah, like that's where it's at, and mm -hmm. and these small companies that can actually get in because I don't know, there's all these tweakers that are like, yeah, we're well, we're like, all we're just all on it. like we just want just a little bit, mm -hmm. I, but which is hard because it's hard for me because I use you go out there and I test all these foils and they're all so good. You just got so good, I all agree. of them, Everybody all these brands, foil. all of them, you know. Mm -hmm. You could I mean, like, like all, the, all the new Armstrong stuff that yeah, just came out—it's it. mind blowing, whatever. right? And code and whatever, right? Yeah, all the lifts got five thousand. Now they're new doing all these coming. like yeah. downwind foils that they've got. Mm -hmm. They've got bigger downwind foils now because they're, mm -hmm. you know, you know, merging towards more beginners mm -hmm. <laughs> versus like the high end, right? Because that's like, it. I appreciate that they came <coughs> out, like code came out with like that focus on kind of like 
the more high end performance yeah. at first because it was really nice for all of us kind of looking for it. Yeah, but then they now they're that. merging in and they're then exactly. they're expanding. Yeah, right? exactly. And they knew that they knew mm -hmm. that's what they were gonna do, but they focused first on mm -hmm. the foilers first, and then people to get mm -hmm. into it. And yeah, I mean you could you could throw a dart and get on a foil of any of these brands mm -hmm. and it would be amazing. Like all of them are doing, it just depends on your market and where you are, what you're going to be on and then grow into that and see where it takes you. You mm -hmm. know, the equipment is a very important part of your progression and what you're going to do and what sport you're going to do. So I think you have to, you have to pick very wisely, especially if you're going to learn how to downwind, pick your foil wisely, you know, your equipment, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very important piece and it depends where you are. You know, so you have to be very specific because I see people on forums or they ask me questions like, what foil should I get? And I'm like, well, what sport are you doing? What board are you? What level are you? What conditions do you have? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's so many questions around, you know, kiting, it's very simple. How much wind do you have? Well, we've got this much wind. Get a 12 meter kite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's I, it. I think it's a great, great point, right? Like, as <clears> you look at, um, okay what's happening in Florida and like that was where Takuma was talked about a ton right because Takuma really matched those slow moving sandbar style wave mm -hmm. conditions like I mean that's where I learned like I totally get it a lot of the boys over there are still ripping those right and then obviously Unifoil put out the progression foil and whatever which I think is very tuned to that same kind of riding obviously having maybe more high end and whatever and then you look at lift lift was built to move fast yeah, right it's fast high lift always fast, fast Fast as fuck. Twitchy, fast, I remember, high performance. I can't remember who it was. or I, I wish I remembered who said it or something. He's like, oh, I ride this foil or whatever. And Nick said, oh, you want to go slow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's totally, like, dude. cool, if you want to go sometimes slow. Sometimes you want to go slow. You know, sometimes you do want to go slow. But yeah. on this island, you want to go fast, yeah, right? Because fast, we got reef yeah. breaks, and they yeah. move, and the ocean moves. And, yeah. and I, I think, like, the gear is so important, and we've never had more good options. So uh, this is a sport, unlike many, where uh, gear really can be the difference mm -hmm. between achieving and not achieving. Yeah, 100%. And yeah. learning and not learning. And... I think that's this, what's. I think that's goes back to the downwind conversation. Why I think this is. So the year I just want to like rewind. Every Look, brand. I just rewound. So you're yeah. double rewinding I'm, my rewind. I'm re 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 <laughs> rewinding your rewind. Is that yeah? Every every brand is really good, and they all have a lot of good foils. But you have to pick within your range. But North is the best, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I was gonna say. Thank you. Yeah, let's just place that right there. Little know. plug for the shop. Little plug for the shop. <laughs> I do a lot of things for the shop, but no, every every brand has their. Every brand is good, but you have to pick within their range. Every range is different, mm -hmm. right? So you have to pick and choose the right foil, mm -hmm. and it makes a huge difference. You don't have to pick the right brand, but also pick the right range for your style and mm -hmm. for. So it's hard, man. When people come in, they're like, "I want a foil." You're like, "What are you doing?" Great one hour conversation mm -hmm. into like what do you want to do and what do you want to progress into how much do you want to spend and where do you want to go from there you know and, and it's a it's a hard one to wrap my head around because i do want to do i want to do good for whoever is coming in to want to learn how to foil there's all these options you know that's why i mm -hmm. pick and choose my brands very carefully because i can't have like every brand under the rainbow because then what do you do like <laughs> like no, I, I've always agreed right. with your your thoughts on that, right? Like, because I think a lot of shops you go into and they have, you know, they, they want to kind of have everything because they don't want to not have something a consumer potentially wants. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, fostering the right choices for growth of the sport, right? Like, I think that's, that's where we've got to go. It's a hard sport to get into. Yeah. It's intimidating. The foil looks scary. I think for all you surfers out there and uh, longboarders and whatever, like, Foils are not as dangerous as you think. Yeah. Like, yes, people shouldn't be ripping through the lineup uncontrolled. But let's be real. Like, a log flying down the lineup <laughs> with a broken leash is definitely <laughs> as dangerous as uh, <laughs> some prone foiler pumping through. And, and, and I think that there's, like, a balance that we're going to strike long term with that. Um, but I think getting people into good gear where they can progress, right, and, and get into the sport. Because where is it going to go? You know, this is a more efficient use of like 
water energy, right, than a surfboard or whatever. And, and the, look, there's those days, right? Like we go out towing at Caballos when we get kicked off because all the surfers are, 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 are out there. We don't get kicked off. We move. We, we politely yeah. move Remove due to surf etiquette. Yes, yes, of course. Slash get kicked <laughs> off. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, like it is magical, right? Like yeah. the, the magic of surfing in high energy waves is, is it's incomparable. Like you can't do like foiling will never be what shortboarding is on a big yeah. wave. No, right? no, for sure. Yeah. Uh, or, 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 or riding a gun on jaws or whatever. Right. Like, I mean, you saw Matt, uh, I can't ever say his ex extra extreme barrier, whatever, <laughs> the guy, you know, I'm talking about the guy who, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. who foiled jaws this year yeah. and caught that incredible, wave that was like the first time we saw somebody ride a big wave on a foil in such like a critical section position yeah yeah and it was really magical um i i think that aesthetically that it was it not. was yeah <laughs> aesthetic uh, yeah aesthetically it was not yeah, as surfy, there. right yeah yeah, yeah 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 but 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 i mean i no, think for sure i think it's, anytime it's, you see somebody on a on a head high wave or higher on a surfboard it's, it's you, moving you see on the power up. yeah but but you know in any other application below six foot i think a, a foil is probably a more efficient vessel on the water you can do more you can play on the wave more your rides longer you're getting more turns and and i think surfers are seeing that right and the barrier of entry has got to get lower mm -hmm. to grow the sport yeah for um, sure and and i think that equipment all of those things play a role in that right like fear of it all those things play a role in kind of holding the sport down and and uh look there's more excitement than ever about it and and i just i think that 10 20 years from now we're going to look at foiling um, and it's going to be a much bigger segment of surf community than it is today. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's got to be. It has to be. I mean, there's no choice. And we're going to be on like space foiling. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at that button. <laughs> Which button? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I know, I know. But I hope, I hope not. I think, I feel like no, we've all gotten so fit from downwinding. I'm yeah. afraid that the the batteries are gonna. <laughs> to Mickey's point, they're gonna make us all fat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. You wanna you wanna foil on your own will, you know. Well, there's uh, nothing like tapping into that energy, right? No, like 100%. In, in, in the most yeah, free sure, way, and sure. and on the lightest equipment, you know, like all of that matters, and and yeah. that's the pinnacle, right? Like that's the pinnacle, that moment of freedom out there where you're just tapped in to 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 literally like the the moon energy, right? Like we're, we're talking about like the craziest shit. We're, we're wavelengths in the middle of a body of water, you know, and we're tapping into that and flying and, and having these four or five minute long journeys. And, you know, I think that's the magic of downwinding is, is having that moment of being able to connect to the ocean for such a long time in such a hyper-focused phase and like being able to make turns and connect and read the matrix and just be in that moment of like half a mile offshore, a mile offshore. Yeah. Cranking turns, like you said, like you just got towed into a wave, you yeah. know, and, and making bottom turns. And I mean, that is just the coolest shit ever. I feel like that's a great ending. And I feel like we've had probably too many pernicious and we're going too deep into our feelings of foils. Isn't isn't that the whole point of this thing? <laughs> and also, as long as you're not driving, there's never too many pernicious. <laughs> <laughs> Walt, I think we could go for hours and hours. So... Let's have you on we the show again, for sure. I'd love it, dude. Love what, it. what do you want to leave people with? Anything special? Oh, man. Yeah, that was that's my big moment, huh? Yeah, I think... <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> keep it short. Keep God it damn short. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I'm going to keep this real short. Uh, drink beer. Go foiling. Don't give up. Go foiling. Drink beer. Don't give up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In that order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, there you go. There you go. All right, man. Thanks, Walt. We'll yeah, it's see been you great. Time. Yeah, cheers. cheers, man.